Imagine with me, if you will, writing the story of your life up until today. See if you can go back in time to conjuring up for the first few chapters of this story about your early childhood, maybe the home that you grew up in, your favorite tree, your favorite book, your relationship with your parents. Maybe the next few chapters could be about going to school that first day, that worst teacher, that best teacher, that crush on that boy or that girl. Imagine the next few chapters perhaps being about coming into adulthood, your first kiss, your first job, your first overseas adventure, and then a series of events that brought you here to today. Even if you were the only person to read this book, I think you'd learn a lot about yourself. Now imagine with me, if you can, writing the story of your life to come. Could you, for instance, take the trajectory that you're on and just push it forward in a storied way? Or would you even want to? Would you want to make a massive turn? If you could change things right now and take a different direction, different work, different relationships, different location, could you project that in a storied way and then follow through with it? Are we even allowed? Is that predicting the future? or perhaps creating it, at least for yourself. Let's hold that question in tension. Let's say we start our conversation on an airplane. First class, of course. Um, actually, I never talk to people on airplanes, but um, I'm too damn miserable back there. Um, but if I was here, flew to Champagne, very chatty. So we strike up a conversation, and we exchange destinations and that sort of thing. And usually in these kind of conversations, um, somebody asks a question, so what is it that you do? It's a way of triangulating each other, maybe just getting to know each other. I might ask about your work. You might tell me whether you loved it or not, and whether you're flying away from it or towards it. If you ask me what I was doing on this particular trip, I'd tell you I was heading to Auckland. I was going to do a cooking class demonstrating Mexican food having lived in Mexico for a little while and growing up in California. So you might say at that point, oh, so you're a chef then? And I'd say, yeah, I guess you could say that. And noticing the question mark, I might go on to explain. Most chefs, in my experience, work in an isolated kitchen, cut off from the rest of the dining experience. I've done that, but it's not my favorite thing. What I really love is preparing food that I can serve to people, sit down with them and really enjoy it celebrate it with them, perhaps having a conversation around the ingredients, where it came from, its provenance, the terroir behind the provenance. I might go into this or that ingredient and, and share about this wasabi that just came up from Canterbury, which is an amazing place to grow wasabi in the world. And uh, that I've learned that because I'm interviewing about 60 food producers over the last three years for a food blog that I write, to which you might say, oh, so you're a writer then. I'd say, yeah, that too. I really enjoy championing people's stories, learning alongside of them, the travel involved. I might tell you about the book I've written on relationships or vocational identity, or the latest project was a cookbook. And what I really enjoyed about that was making the food every day, and right before eating it, taking some pictures. I love the photography aspect of that. To which you might say, oh, and a photographer too, getting the gist by now. And if you hadn't reached for that in-flight magazine, I'd probably go on to tell you <laughs> that I really enjoy, I know, I, I really enjoy doing these things from home. Cooking, writing, photography, a space that I've intentionally designed to be creative, a place that I can work from, but also that I can share on Airbnb, with whom I'm also an international photographer and a community organizer doing pictures for them around the world, but back here in this region where I can continue to do these interviews and uh, some social media for other innovators and website for others. And, and one of the things I've really been enjoying is back at home in Kingston, um, catering for the local cycle tours that are going from Kingston around the mountain to Walter Peak. Because at the end of the day, I'm a bit of a chef as well. Hopefully by that time, I would have shut up and listened to your story a little bit more. And, and you might have shared past the career, past the job, into the things that you've loved, those things that spark joy in you. 
and will probably result in something very similar, what I'd call a tapestry of identity. It can't be defined by work or where we live or how much we earn, but through those things that are important to us, that resonate within us. And it's these things that are character traits, our passions, our values, personality traits, that when we start to hear each other's story, we start to unfold more of this identity. And I find this fascinating. Um, any part of this identity tapestry can be broken out like a fra fractal. So, for instance, if we talked about creativity, and you said, well, what does creativity mean to you? I'd say, well, um, I think everybody's creative. The question is, how are we creative? And you can unpack that through more stories and learn more about a person's creativity. You could take one of those facets of creativity and then unpack that even further and keep going down that rabbit hole. And the more we know of each other, the more we hear of each other's stories, the more of this identity sort of unfolds and unpacks until it gets obsessive compulsive and, and extensive. And I think this is true of, of all of us, that we're not one thing. We are many, many things. And we love many things for many reasons. Now, if you're thinking about careers and jobs, this can be really helpful. For instance, you can look at this identity tapestry and say, if I took this element and this element and this element, maybe I could put them together and then I could choose to be a chef, for instance. Or if I look more closely at the nuance of these identity statements, I might pick caterer for local cycle tours across the street from me in Kingston, a more refined choice. And that being one of the many projects that I do because I get to be myself in the world, I hope. Um, Emily Wapnick, in her recent TED Talk, called this being a multi-potentialite. And I think we're getting more and more used to the idea that people aren't just one career, there are many things over the course of their lifetime. Four or five jobs, four or five interests, passions. We're becoming great amateurs. You know, we love things and we do them well just for fun and sometimes for money. So all this identity stuff is very helpful for choosing a career, but our careers can't um, encapsulate all of our identity. There's more going on here, and our conversation on the plane doesn't look like a spreadsheet or a mind map. It looks like a, an arc, a story. And these stories are embellished with people and places and things and events that reveal who we really are and what's important to us. And it's the texture of our identity and our stories together it starts to make sense of our past and where we come from. Ultimately, what these things do is they reveal things about our humanity, our core values, our aspirations, and our meaning, what's really important to us. So in a very real sense, I think that stories reveal identity, and identity can help us project stories. Owen Flanagan of Duke University mirrors this thought when he says that humans in all cultures tend to cast their identities in a narrative form because we are inveterate storytellers. It's a natural, habitual thing for us. I think we live and breathe in story. I think it's why we love film and books and social media even today, because it, it helps project and reflect the ongoing story of our lives. But there's a tension here. I've noticed that when it comes to the really important things in our lives, for instance, choosing a job, we tend to strip out all the storytelling elements and we get really didactic and we start to focus in on these goals, these objectives, these outcomes. You can see this in job descriptions. Um, you can see this in our institutional planning as well. We get very academic when it comes to looking at the future, and not very storied, which is interesting. Because even though I think identity is a wonderful thing to fill out a job ap application with, because if you're doing one, you'll notice it. Usually, the job application says, we're looking for a person who's this, this, and this. And if your identity statements line up with that, you could perhaps choose that job. But that's not the sum total of our lives, is it? Interestingly, when it comes to relationships, we don't do that spreadsheet thing. We still think of relationships in storied terms. We love romantic comedies for this reason. And we love putting our identity into those relationships. And I wonder if there's something telling about that. When, when the future gets close to our heart, we come back to story and looking at story as a way of projecting into the future. The um, classic textbook for story writing, for screenplays, novels, comes from a man named Joseph Campbell who wrote in 1949 a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And it's sort of the Bible for screenplay writers. In that, 
Campbell talks about three main rites of passage in any given story. And, this, and he says this is true throughout culture and history and myth. You'll see it popping up over and over again. The first rite of passage is departure, where you leave the normal world towards something that's challenging. The second rite is where you go through some sort of transformation. And in that transformation, you're initiated into probably your deeper, more whole, I guess, hero-like self. And then in the third act, it's return. It's bringing that transformation back home with you um, into the real world. What he's talking about here isn't a clever way of telling stories or making a better film. He's talking about something that's culturally, anthropologically true about who we are. What I've done is I've looked at this idea of, of rites of passage and story and looking back at my life and identity and tried to see if I could bring those together to get an understanding of the arcs and the curves of what's happened so far. So, for instance, in Campbell's first act of departure, there's this call to adventure. And I can see these aspects of my identity, being curious, being international, etc., but these are things that spur me forward into that call. And it helps me make decisions, and it helps me make um, sense of the things that I've done and some choices that I've made, and it leads me to the next act, which is initiation. Initiation is where the transformation happens, through the road of trials, meeting key people, being tempted, the atonement. You go through the hard times. And I can see, in this case, where my identity statements will help me sort out my needs versus my wants and really test the substance of who I am as a person. And then that gets me into the third act, which he calls the return. Having gone through this kind of transformation, and you will have experienced this yourself in different trials or adventures that you've been on, it's really challenging to bring that back home. And so there's usually this refusal to return. And I can see in my life where there's aspects of my identity that have helped me sort of wrestle with that and bring those things back into view, especially, say, for instance, the relationship with my father and then reconciling that with who I am as a person. But my question is, can I use this same structure of identity and storytelling to look and actually write a story of my life to come? So I tested this theory 16 years ago. I was in um, Europe at the time, working. It was 1999, and I had come to the end of a season in life. You know where you feel like the grace is just gone. So what I did, as common sense prevails, is I decided to put myself on a boat in Norway for five days. I booked passage on the coastal steamer that went from Bergen to Tromsø through these beautiful fjords, delivering mail, not much of a ship, just some large windows and copious amounts of pickled herring. Um, morning, noon, and night. That's what we ate. So the first day, I spent all day, eight hours at least, writing down every key memory I could think of. I remember getting my first puppy at two years old, my father handing this dog through the window in the back of our station wagon. I was thinking chocolates. We ended up with a puppy. I'm okay with that. Um, my first kiss at 12, my confrontations with my father later on, and different situations that I remembered um, throughout the, the course of my life, I wrote them down, and then at the end of the day, I read them back through in one sort of continuous sweep. Second day, I wanted to look at the present, so I took a bird's-eye view at the context of my life, um, whether it was my relationships, my work, my location, etc., and just kind of got a view of how that past had brought me to this place here. And it was on the third day where the mad scientist scrolls showed up, and I started to think maybe I could take that same trajectory of self, but then write it into the future as a story, instead of just, say, plans and goals and objectives. So that's what I did. I spent the next three days writing out the next five, 10, or 15 years. This was not um, a detailed story like a graphic novel or anything like that. It was a broad narrative. It was, it was putting myself in places and situations in a storied way that I could then choose my own adventure once I got to certain places or, or junctures in that story. It was based on a clarity of self, that was gleaned from the previous exercise, but it gave me enough to sort of lean into the world, lean into the future, you know, without sensing that this is all going to happen this way, this way, because again, it's not predicting the future. It's intentional 
choices that I make to actually create the future, or at least my future. And maybe as we're all doing that, we're creating the future. With, of course, lots of room for serendipity, because you can't control everything, and you wouldn't want to. And as I learned not too long after that, that there's going to have to be room for crisis, because I had to face cancer and the deadening sound of the terms malignant melanoma two times, or divorce, or estrangement from family, massive left turns that left me probably at my lowest point in life ever. But it was having that sense of who I was, being articulated, that held me in the game. It helped me get up the next day when I was at my lowest point because I knew still that there was somebody in there and somewhere for that person to go. As I look towards the future now, I think, well, that's, that's exactly what I want to do again. I think ultimately all of us want to be or be our true selves in the world. And then as our true selves to belong and know where home is, that third act, the return. Where is that? Where am I going with that? And then to connect from our sense of home. For me, that's important to know whether it's going to be clear in my mind if that, that story is heading towards specific projects, like if I want to work with food or not, or where I'd like to live. So I get the, the detailed aspects of the story and the broader sweep of that story as well. So now I'm looking at the next 15 years and trying to take everything that I've learned and try to project again. Because I don't think you, you have to do this just once, or you can probably do this three or four times in your life. It starts with a retrospective. For me, that's um, hundreds of pages in a moleskin journal, just writing down things that have happened and trying to get a clue on what they mean. And from those retrospectives, and what I can learn about myself, my mistakes, my victories, who I am, I'm now projecting the outline ahead. It's a very simple outline. It's not super sexy or clear or, or super storied even. Um, I really want to learn how to live from the heart in everything that I do. I want from that heart to design a space called home that I can then make wonderful and beautiful things from and then from the things that I make connect with my community. Now I'll fill in the gaps and I'll, I'll add as much guiding as guiding is needed. But it's an outline to start me off again. It's something to lean into again. Ultimately, this has given me um, the ability to move from my fears to finding my courage, giving me a light and a, a dark and confusing path. If we were back on that plane together, I'd ask you again, if, you know, imagine writing the story of your life to come and look backwards. And I'd hope that you'd have a, a happy ending again and again and again as you project these stories into your future. Thank you.